very good day to everyone uh, here at EPC and also joining us uh, remotely. And uh, welcome to this hybrid policy dialogue on cleaner air, time to capture the health, economic and environmental benefits organized by the European Policy Center and supported by SWETS and all policies for a healthy Europe. My name is Stefan Shipka. I'm a policy analyst at APC, and I'll be moderating this discussion. So today we will discuss uh, state of play, challenges and prospects when it comes to improving the quality of air we breathe here uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, needless to say, it concerns our health, uh, our well-being, but it also concerns our economy, our society more generally, and of course our environment. So uh, it is uh, something that is of great importance, I would say, uh, and also just one, one striking figure that maybe you already know, but it's good to repeat it over and over again, is that hundreds of thousands of people die prematurely in Europe every year because of uh, air pollution. Uh, that is already, I think, enough say that uh, this uh, topic deserves to be very high on the agenda and that's what also we are trying to do with uh, with this discussion and see how we what we can do to improve the current uh, situation uh, um, and um, we will discuss so we will discuss that we will also discuss how the ongoing policies to improve the, the current situation uh, such as the the recent uh, commission's proposal to uh, raise the standards on air quality uh, but also within the context uh, of the current uh, energy uh, crisis. Uh, so yeah, that is basically what we will discuss today. This is a hybrid event. So as mentioned, we have uh, in-person and also virtual uh, speakers and participants. Uh, and we have, so um, I will um, first give the floor to our panelists for initial remarks, but also then we will hear from our uh, respondents and then we will uh, move on to the Q&A. When it comes to online participants, uh, uh, they uh, uh, yeah, online participants can write their questions, and uh, I will then take them and direct them towards the speakers. And I will encourage our online participants to write their questions as soon as they can, so we can then um, so we can address as many questions as possible by the, by the end of the event. So, without uh, any further ado, I would uh, like to give the floor to our first. Uh, uh, panelists for today. It's uh, Katherine Gansleben, uh, Head of Group Air Pollution, Environment and Health from the European Environment Agency, who is joining us remotely. And I hope that uh, you hear us and that you see us. Yes, I do. Thank you very much, perfect, Stefan. Perfect. Thank you. And happy to hear from you about the state of play with air quality in Europe and the wider implications for our economy and society. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stefan. And I am just sharing a presentation with you because I would like to talk you through some key facts and figures. Can I just confirm that you can see that? Yes, indeed, we can see it. Super. So thank you for the opportunity to speak briefly this afternoon. Um, at the European Environment Agency, a couple of weeks ago, we launched our latest evidence on air quality in Europe. And I would invite you to have a look at that interesting and exciting report. I'm going to talk you through some of our key results. So what you're looking at here is the share of the European population that's exposed to levels of air pollution on the left above the current EU standards. And you can see that actually we're doing rather well if we look at exposure above the legal limit values. Um, whereas if you look on the right, um, you can see the share of the population exposed above the latest health-based guidelines put forward by our colleagues at the World Health Organization. These are the 2021 guidelines. And there you can see that the vast majority of Europeans are still exposed to levels of air pollution that we know, based on solid evidence, is damaging their health. So for fine particulate matter, we're talking about 96% of the population. This is exactly why we need to support the proposal for the revision of the air quality directives. And so what does that mean in terms of health? Well, the impacts on health are serious. 
we're talking about irritation of the respiratory system, but also chronic disease in the respiratory system, also in the cardiovascular system, the reproductive system, and the neurological system. So all throughout the body, we also know that air pollution can cross the placenta to the developing fetus. In the EU, 7% of deaths from ischemic heart disease are directly linked to exposure to fine particulate matter, 8% of deaths from stroke, and 9% of deaths from lung cancer. Those are the main causes of death in Europe, so those numbers are significant. And if we translate that into premature deaths, what we see is that in the EU for 2020, fine particulate matter at levels above the 2021 WHO guideline caused over 230,000 premature deaths, as Stefan indicated at the beginning. Now, if you look on the right, what you can see is uh, the years of life lost, which is a kind of more nuanced expression of that burden. Um, and you can see that in Iceland, of course, they have fantastic air quality. Um, in Finland as well, the years of life lost per 100,000 are only at 12. But it really changes uh, depending upon where you live. Uh, so down in Bulgaria, it's over 1,500 years of life loss per 100,000. And in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have the highest level of over 2,300 years of life lost per 100,000 people. Just to pick up on that inequity, because what we see is it's not just geographical, it's also linked to socioeconomic status. So what this map on the left shows you is the brown hatching shows you the 20% of regions that are most polluted. And the yellow to brown coloring shows you GDP. So the yellow is the highest GDP and the dark brown is those areas with the lowest GDP. So you see the spatial coincidence of poverty and pollution in Europe. There are exceptions, of course. The Po Valley in northern Italy is both wealthy and polluted, but the vast majority, we have this coincidence of social deprivation and environmental deprivation, poor quality environments. And when we talk about health impacts, it's not just premature deaths because people also live with sickness. What you can see here is the morbidity, so the time spent living with disease from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So this is years lived with disability. And of course, it varies across the EU in terms of the concentrations of fine particulate matter. So again, this real inequity in terms of where you live. And what that means is human suffering, costs on the healthcare system, and lost productivity. But it's not all bad. We have made significant progress. Policies to reduce air pollution save lives. What you can see here is EEA's estimates of premature deaths from 2007 up to the most recent year, 2020. Those deaths have fallen by 45% since 2005. And what that means is that we are on track to meet the target in the Zero Pollution Action Plan of reducing premature deaths linked to fine particulate matter by 55%. That's a positive message. As well as impacts on health, we also see impacts on ecosystems. What this map is showing you is the area of ecosystem in Europe where we have critical loads for nitrogen deposition exceeded. That means that those ecosystems are subject to eutrophication, which reduces biodiversity and reduces the quality of the ecosystem and also jeopardizes the quality of drinking water. Again, a cost, a social cost. Ground level ozone also damages crops and timber. And indeed, we estimate that in 2019, ozone uh, led to losses to wheat yield that costs more than 1.4 billion. So these are substantial social and economic costs.
What are the main sources of air pollution, particularly PM 2.5? I really want to focus in on residential heating. So you can see that yellow bar um, is from residential heating in terms of emissions. We also see significant emissions of PM 2.5, uh, sorry, of ammonia from agriculture, and that leads to the secondary formation of fine particulate matter. And just focusing back on that residential heating, it's also a big issue for greenhouse gas emissions. So we see this opportunity for synergies across these two policy agendas. And just unpacking that by country, what you see here is the percentage of emissions of fine particulate matter from heating buildings by country. And what you can see is that in some areas of Europe, those countries to the right hand side of this bar, up to 80% of emissions are coming from heating buildings. And it's those same areas that are the most polluted. Why? Because people are burning solid fuels. They're burning coal, they're burning wood, um, and that's leading to emissions that's then directly damaging people's health. And so, of course, there's a major link here to energy poverty. And I end by emphasizing this data from 2020. Again, 2020. So when we see this data for 2022 with the current crisis, it's going to look much worse. In 2020, 7% of the EU population couldn't keep their home warm. And that went up to 28% in Bulgaria. This is the issue we need to tackle if we want to clean up our air. And this is why the package of measures that the Commission has proposed, the Fit for 55, the renovation wave, the Repower EU, and also the Next Generation EU, have huge potential to address this issue. Thank you very much. That was my introduction. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for uh, for this uh, great overview on, on where we are. And uh, also, I would uh, uh, highlight the note of optimism that actually the the trends in premature deaths that uh, they are decreasing. Uh, so that is great. One question I just wanted to ask, based on your uh, estimations thus far, what would you say? To what extent has the situation changed now since basically we are more or less phasing out, we phased out uh, COVID uh, and the, uh, the con confinement um, that we had before. What do you see in a nutshell? How are the trends uh, looking in terms so of air when, quality? And thanks. Yeah, so that's a great question. So during COVID, we did see that levels of certain air pollutants fell, in particular uh, nitrogen dioxide, because that's associated with transport emissions, so road transport. Um, and we saw significant falls up to 60% in some cities. Fine particulate matter fell a little bit, but not as much. And essentially we've pretty much bounced back now. We expect to see a pretty much bounce, bounce back in the data from 2021. Thanks, Thanks for, for, for this uh, additional uh, uh, information. And indeed that's something that should um, also make us worry because in a way, in some way, uh, the situation was a bit better before, and especially because of the reduced uh, mobility. But, and again, also what you mentioned, there is a long-term downward trend in terms of uh, uh, mortality rates. So that is good. That is great. But then if the situation was good enough, we wouldn't have had uh, the latest commission's proposal for high quality, uh, higher quality uh, air quality standards. And I'm happy to have um, Mr. Francois Wackenut uh, here with us, uh, head of unit for air, uh, clean air and urban uh, mobility or digital environment, European Commission. And it would be also great if uh, you could, building also what Catherine mentioned, provide also an overview of the existing and upcoming policy initiatives to tackle air pollution. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. So thank you, Stefan, uh, for setting the scene and thank you to Catherine for um, describing so accurately the um, situation as it stands in Europe when it comes to <coughs> air quality, but also sketching, you know, what it could look like uh, if we project ourselves into uh, some of the future trends that we uh, can um, think about. So what I would like to do now is to take you through three main points. The first one is obviously that air quality remains a challenge in Europe, and you've heard quite a bit about this already from Catherine, so I think I can keep that part 
brief that we need to start there because this is the challenge that we're trying to address. The second point is that our proposal for a revised ambient air quality directive is going to deliver what we believe are very impactful changes. And the third point um, would be that our revision needs to be seen in context because we're not operating in a vacuum. We're looking at an overall set of policy changes that uh, need to be um, integrated in order for some of the uh, impacts to be multiplied and accelerated. So on the first point, air quality remains a challenge in Europe. You heard uh, from Catherine where we stand. You heard about the uh, 300,000 premature death numbers. You've heard about the impact on ecosystems. You've heard about the inequalities that unfortunately characterize the way the population is exposed to air pollution. So this is an equity issue, which is very much at the core of what the commission also wants to deliver. It's a health priority. It's an environmental priority. It's obviously also a social priority. And last but not least, it's an economic priority. If we look at the overall um, economic um, losses that are linked to air pollution, you know, the range that we give and what matters there is uh, the range more than the uh, numbers that I'm going to give to you. You know, we're looking at 231 to 853 billion euros per year in terms of, uh, you know, health costs of, uh, of air pollution. And if we uh, go into the work days, it's 8 billion. If we go into ecosystems damage, it's between 4 and 12 billion. If we go into crop yield loss, so agriculture is at the same time, as was described by Catherine, a sector that needs to do more because it is at the source of ammonia emissions in particular. But it's also a sector that is a victim of air pollution in that uh, ozone pollution reduces uh, crop yield. So the cost there is uh, 10 to 11 billion. But there are also damages when it comes to forest. Um, and there we're looking at 19 billion. So um, and damage to buildings, you know, the, the browning on the buildings, 1 billion. So this is no anecdotal uh, policy setting, and this is one that requires a forceful response. So that's my second point. Our proposal will make a difference, and we believe that difference will be significant. So the first thing that I should emphasize there is that it was high time for us to revise our legislation. It was high time because the last time we did it was in 2008, and the legislation that we're talking about um, you know, is 2004 for uh, heavy metals in particular, and 2008 for the rest. So we were covering altogether 12 pollutants, and it was high time for us to look at a revision. And we wanted to do that as per the mandate of the European Green Deal in a way that takes into account the latest available evidence on the table. And Catherine also presented the WHO recommendations that were um, published uh, on the 21st of September, 2021. And we used that as a key element in defining our um, ambition. And that was in line with the mandate from the European Green Deal that called for, um, in particular, more closely aligning with the WHO recommendations as they were public, published. So if we look at now the proposal, um, maybe through four key elements of it. First one, well, environment and health is a core component of it. And there, as I've said, we've not fully aligned with the WHO, but we've certainly aligned a lot more closely. We've defined a zero pollution objective to 2050 that precisely also goes um, towards that uh, alignment. And in the meantime, we've set up um, what we call intermediate um, targets that will be operational as from 2030, and that go a long way in terms of advancing the level of ambition compared to where we were today, while, of course, um, keeping our options open because we have a review mechanism that has been introduced in the legislation that will ensure that we will revisit starting in 2028, so not uh, far from, from here, assuming that the adoption process goes according to plan, and that will revisit uh, our levels of ambition as well as other provisions, notably on the basis of the evolution of um, scientific evidence, but also technological advancements as well as societal developments. So, we have a framework that is dynamic and ambitious at the same time. Second element, much clearer governance and enforcement rules. The proposal that we have includes a number of innovations. One of those key innovations relates to the fact that for the first time, 
we will require air quality plans to be put in place before the standards come into place. And that is in cases where there's an anticipation to prevent an exceedance um, before it happens in 2030. So this is something that is quite uh, demanding in terms of the uh, new approach that it entails, but it's actually a safeguard that is necessary if we are to deliver on the level of ambition that we've set. We've also improved enforceability with new provisions that relate to access to justice, to penalties, to compensation. The idea there is to empower uh, our citizens and any of uh, those uh, representatives that would act on their behalf in order to ensure that their right to clean air is guaranteed in every corner of Europe. And as you know, this is an issue where there have been discrepancies thus far, uh, depending on where one looks um, in the European Union. Last point there, we will also set better requirements for transboundary cooperation, which is a key element if we are to be effective as air pollution knows no borders. Third element in the framework that I would like to emphasize, strengthen monitoring and assessment. We obviously need to measure well in order to be able to manage well. And in relation to this, what we are proposing is to simplify as well as at the same time improve the rules for monitoring. We want to measure also the lower levels of pollutant concentrations, and we want to use modeling a lot more than we have in the past. This is no longer 2008. There is a lot more in terms of modeling that is possible today that was not possible back then. We need to tap into it, and we need to factor this into the implementation framework. And last point in relation to monitoring and uh, the overall assessment, we're also looking beyond the pollutants, the 12 pollutants that I've uh, referred to that we're going to regulate. We also want to expand monitoring and assessment to other pollutants that are of emerging concern, and that is in line with the WHO recommendations. So that applies to ultrafine particles, to black carbon, to ammonia, and these are innovations that we are convinced will certainly improve um, the um, added value of our measures and framework. And we will also do so in guaranteeing that there's better information and communication to our citizens. We can be very pleased, I think, with the level of engagement of civil society and citizens at large on air quality. But Eurobarometer after Eurobarometer, and we've conducted one just before the adoption of this proposal, we can still see that we need to do even better. Uh, it's not enough to have half of the population that is aware of the challenges. We need to empower them to actually, um, in uh, you know, due course, act on the uh, pollution threats that they face. And for that, improved information and communication is needed. And we're building on a great product that uh, the EA has developed jointly with us, which is the Air Quality Index. And we've enshrined the Air Quality Index into the legislation in calling for uh, national indices that will actually ensure that this is harmonized in a way that guarantees that the same information is provided wherever you may be sitting in, in, in Europe. Um, so the idea there is to include um, hourly reporting that uh, will, of course, uh, be uh, very uh, relevant for citizens to be then um, in a position to respond to those warnings and to what it means for their um, overall dealings. Um, what I would like to, to emphasize um, there as well is that our proposal is one that delivers very much on the economic uh, dimension. I mentioned earlier the costs of air pollution. You heard the numbers. Now, if we look at the costs of the measures that um, we're, we're looking at here, it's about 6 billion per year. It's actually even less um, because we've been quite conservative in our assessments. But the annual gross benefits will range from 42 to 121 billion per year. So you can see that we're looking at a factor seven there. So this is a very significant reason to act and a very powerful message to pass. My last point, air pollution is obviously tackled within a broader spectrum of policy uh, changes. And our proposal is part of the Green Deal, and the Green Deal is far more encompassing. Fit for 55 is a crucial element of it and will deliver a number of benefits for clean air. It's very clear that uh, all the energy and climate transition efforts that we're engaged on will uh, contribute to accelerating um, the path of progress in the coming years. But we also need to continue to act on the sources of air pollution. Mm -hmm. And um, we've got two proposals that are currently also being discussed in co-decision. One, the Industrial Emissions Directive, 
which is very uh, relevant in terms of reducing precisely the emissions from the overall industry actors that are covered by the frame of the directive. But we've most recently as well put forward Euro 7, um, which is about uh, vehicle emission standards and which is also another crucial uh, piece of the jigsaw. And all we're doing in terms of uh, energy efficiency and the acceleration as a result of Repower EU, as a response to the war of aggression in Ukraine and energy prices in Europe, is also going to play its part in accelerating the transition. So we will need to continue with those as well as to accelerate the work at international level. And that will be my last point. Next week in Geneva, the executive body of the Air Convention will be meeting. And one of the key elements there is uh, the Gothenburg Protocol that some of you will know. And the Gothenburg Protocol is in a uh, process of, um, well, uh, intense discussions in Geneva in the context of uh, possible review. And this is one of the dimensions that we need to continue to work on because air pollution is transboundary by nature and we will need to work not just within the EU, but also with neighbors outside the EU without whom we cannot succeed. So thanks and uh, sorry if I was a bit long. Uh, th th thanks a lot for for this uh, also excellent uh, uh, overview and shedding shedding more light on the on this um, going proposal on the uh, ambient air quality directive, but also other policy initiatives and a number of things you mentioned. Of course, comes to the use policy agenda on this. I'm happy to come back to some of them uh, afterwards, but also for add, uh, uh, mentioning some also interesting figures about the economic loss and also econ potential economic gains if we continue on the path towards improving the quality uh, of our air. And also as going back to what Catherine mentioned, the importance of social dimension and that uh, the exposure to air, uh, air pollution is, we shouldn't just look at the average numbers, we need to consider the regions and uh, different populations suffering different way, depending on the question on of course, social inequality that needs to be tackled. So it's a, uh, it's, uh, it's a complex challenge that really needs to be tackled from different angles. Uh, thank you. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to uh, uh, Jérôme Arnaudis, um, uh, Vice President, uh, Air Solutions Suez. Uh, Jérôme, we heard from the EU representatives on the state of play and upcoming initiatives, and we'll be happy to hear from you your take on the current situation concerning air quality and uh, especially from the industry perspective, any solutions, existing solutions, prospective solutions you could share with us today, barriers that need to be overcome and how we can scale up the solutions to actually uh, improve the quality of air. Yes, thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so before starting, let me uh, introduce Suez. Um, uh, Suez is a 100, if we could pass the slide. I pass the slide here. Uh, Yes, you should. Uh, sorry, the okay, it's here. Yes, yes, okay, can. thanks. Yeah. So, in fact, let me introduce Suez. Um, Suez is a 160 years old company um, dedicated to environmental services. We have an international footprint, 35,000 employees today, and uh, in a few months, 44. Thousand employees. We're making seven billion euro turnover today, and we'll make nine nine billion in the coming uh, weeks after some acquisitions. Um, we provide drinking water for sixty six million people in the world. Uh, we produce uh, three point one terawatt hour of green energy every year. Uh, we avoid four point two million tons. Excuse me. 4.2 million tons of CO2 on behalf of our customer, and we deliver 2 million tons of secondary raw materials. So in fact, in a nutshell, um, circular economy and climate change uh, had been in our DNA for decades. And therefore, uh, we naturally addressed the air quality topics uh, many years ago, and probably 20, 25 years ago. Uh, with Catherine's presentation and Francois' presentation, uh, we all share that um, air pollution, economical impact is huge. There are so many zeros that at the end of the day, I'm lost sometimes, but the only thing I know that it's very, very important. And we are not talking about million, but we are talking about billions here every year. Uh, but on top of this economical, let's say, impact, uh, and most the most important, finally, 
is the human impact. And human impact also is, is huge. Um, uh, we talk about the 200,000, 300,000 premature death in Europe, but in the world, it's 7 million people who dies every year prematurely due to air pollution. We talk about the inequality, uh, and that's true that there is an inequality uh, when we talk, when we see the different area in the world. But in fact, we are all concerned because the air pollution is not only in China or in Asia. The air pollution is everywhere. Um, and we are all concerned, as the WHO said and states, that 91% of the world population is breathing a polluted air. That's what, and by the way, air pollution kills more than heads, alcohol, or malaria. And that's why we call the air pollution the invisible killer. But I have good news <laughs> because solution exists. We said previously air, air pollution or air, uh, the, the, the air quality is improving day after day, even if it's not going fast enough today, but it's improving. And we have solution. Um, when we talk about air topic in Suez, uh, we divide it in three. Uh, the first one is the one from where we start, the odor emissions. Um, so we start here 20 years ago, 25 years ago, because our installation produced odors, and we had to reduce them in order to avoid any um, neighborhood complaints. Um, so when we talk about odor impact, uh, we talk more about comfort or country uh, region attractiveness. The second topic is air quality and the pollutants. And here, that's the topic of today. We are talking about public health. And the last but not least, uh, the climate impact, the greenhouse gas. And we will we'll see to today, everything is linked. Air pollution is linked to climate change. Climate change or air pollution is linked to green energy production or the way we are producing uh, vegetables, uh, the way we are moving from one point to another one using cars. Uh, or other way of transport. So everything is linked. That's one of my message of today. And I would like to take some example, a very clear, very concrete example of what is going or what, yes, what things are moving and where they are moving today. Um, before that, that, by the way, let me tell you, uh, Francois, that uh, in Suez, uh, we uh, fully support the proposal of the Commission when we talk about air quality, uh, new standards, uh, and uh, the, I would say, the priority that EU is giving to these topics, and as you said, the, ec the ecosystem around this topic. And so, taking the, the example of the low emission zone in Spain, um, You said it earlier, Francois. You said we need to monitor well to manage well. And I fully agree with you. Uh, if we don't measure well, we have opinions. If we measure, we have facts. And that's why in Spain, um, uh, every municipality is above 50,000 inhabitants. We need to have low emission zone implemented before end of 2023. So let's say it's tomorrow. And as mentioned before by Catherine and by you also, Francois, uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish government uh, managed to have some uh, financing through the next generation EU funds, so 1.5 billion euro, in order to invest in this monitoring, in this measure, or way to measure. It concerned today 171 town, towns or cities, um, representing more or less 25 million citizens in Spain. There is of course a local legal framework. There is also some, um, let's say, it's included in transformation. On, or as you said before, um, pollution is linked to other topics, and so it's embedded in other topics. And what is a low emission zone? A low emission zone is a zone. Uh, you define a zone in a city or around a city, in a metropolitan area or outside of metropolitan area, where you want to decrease the air pollution. In order to decrease the air pollution, you need to monitor it, to measure. And so um, this, uh, these cities will implement um, some monitoring, which will consist of implementing 
cameras in, in order to count the traffic plates or car plates, um, air quality sensors. We talk about it modeling because we know that model today, especially with all the data analytics, uh, the AI intelligence, artificial intelligence, and so on, you, is really advanced comparing to last 10, the 10 years ago. And we can really take some benefits from that. And also, um, uh, we can also have some um, software or some hypervision tools in order also to show to the population, to the citizen, the impact, the real degree of the pollution on a day basis on the hour, hourly basis, even on, sometimes on the on minute basis, and, and not at the, let's say, city scale, but metric scale. So you really understand, know the pollution you have and the, the quality of you, the air you breathe, not only in the city, but in your neighborhood, in your, let's say, in your house, if I may say. And therefore, they will be able also then to simulate the action they want to put in place and to adjust the action if needed. So let me take one example. You have a city equipped with an air quality monitoring, so a low emissions on definition and the monitoring. And then they decide to reduce or to um, uh, stop the, some cars or some category of cars entering this zone. And they will see the impact on the air quality the day after the implementation. And so very quickly after, they will be able to see if yes or no, there is an impact. And if the impact is sufficient or if they need to go further. And that's why for me, and uh, to come back to what you said, Francois, measure well, manage well, and this tool will be able to bring some real time data, some factual data and to be transparent in order to share this information to the citizen and even sometimes even to let the citizen vote to have some action or not, depending on the impact they want. So for me, that's the one of the major um, uh, step forward we can do on the monitoring. Um, but once we monitor well, we have to act well. And uh, we need we know also that we need to treat need to treat when it's possible, where it's possible, when it's needed, and where it's needed. So I took two examples. The, the first one is on in the metro. We know that in the metro and everywhere in the world, the air quality can be two to 10 times worse than outside. And so it's difficult to say to the people, don't take your car, take the metro, if the air in the metro is more polluted. And you know that if you, more people are taking the metro or will take the metro, then you will need to add some new lines or new trains. And so that's why it's important also to capture this pollution there and to provide to the citizen a better air quality in the metro station. So we did the experimentation in 2020 and 2021. The techni technology today, and not only ours, but there are technology available on the market today to scale up. And we are discussing today in Paris to scale up with the public authority and the railway operators. The second one is regarding kids. In fact, uh, UNICEF in France, alert the French, French government, stating that 75% of the French kids breathe the polluted air. It's everywhere in the world. WHO state that 93% of the kids in the world breathe the polluted air. That's very important for us because we all know that kids breathe two times more than adults. Kids also um, uh, build their immune um, uh, defense before 10. And we also know that the air pollution concentration is higher uh, between one to 1.5 meter height. That means that at kids level. That's why we, we, we innovate, we propose some solution to tackle the air pollution in the schoolyards. There are many other solutions existing, but what I want to show you today is that we have solution dedicated to specific use. And I'm sure that in the coming, coming future, more and more solution will come out in order to tackle these issues. 
So monitoring is very good. And then acting, treating, capture the pollution when and where it will be needed will be a must too. Conclude, um, I would say that um, we, we see, and that's why I'm positive, uh, solution exists. And as Catherine explained in the beginning, air quality is improving day after day. So we are on the good way, but we are not fast enough. We need to speed up. And so that's why uh, we strongly recommend to maintain the ambition proposed by the, environment, the, the commission regarding the air quality standards. We also encourage the industrial sector to invest and to innovate uh, in order to improve their environmental impact. And that's why also we encourage the country and the government uh, to, more, to, to more actively finance the solutions. Uh, we have all the weapons needed to stop the air pollution. We have all weapons needed to kill or to stop the serial killer, the invisible killer, which is this air pollution. So now what we need to do is we need to scale up in order to capture the health, the environment, and the economical benefits from these actions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Jerome, for uh, sharing uh, these uh, a couple of these very interesting uh, and practical solutions to tackle uh, the the air quality or the air pollution challenge, and indeed, as you mentioned, it builds well also on uh, what you mentioned, Francois, on monitoring, and that information is key, and that we can do a lot once we actually know uh, what is uh, happening really in the field, and then concrete measures can be adjusted accordingly, and we can prioritize certain areas, certain populations, uh, such as children. So that is great and happy to hear later more from you about how some of these solutions could be scaled up further, but also very interesting to see the role of innovative solutions and digital solutions to, uh, to move forward. Thank you for this. And I also, because your solutions were about also the, the, the were, were really focused on the local level to a great extent, this is also a good, is a good link uh, to what our uh, final panelists for today will talk about. So uh, we have uh, Lina Forsman, policy officer from the Gothenburg European office, and happy to hear your view on local perspective when it comes to tackling the, uh, uh, the air, air pollution, improving the, the quality of air. Thank you, Stefan, and thank you for the opportunity to be here to speak today. So um, from the city of Gothenburg's perspective, it's very important to work with air quality to improve the air for uh, our citizens. And here we can see that the ambient air quality directives have been an important part in improving upon our work. We've been meeting the European air quality standards for the past few years, but we've been struggling a bit with the more stringent Swedish targets, primarily for nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter. We therefore welcome the Commission proposal and especially its attempt in coming closer to WHO recommendations, because we think that it's, well, we're very concerned with improving the air quality in certain areas and also for our more vulnerable citizens. Uh, we also welcome the, uh, the regional collaboration aspect of the proposal. However, we see that maybe it should also contain some kind of joint uh, collaboration clause with national and EU level. And we are quite curious to see about potential synergies between the air quality plants and sustainable urban mobility plants and plans to tackle noise pollution, since they are direct, um, legislated in different directives and strategies at EU level, but at local level, they are normally, well, it's the same measures normally to tackle them. Um, we're also uh, curious to see whether or not, with, in terms of the monitoring, we think that it's a good thing that it's been extended to include more pollutants, but we are curious to see whether or not there will be funding available for creating methods for measuring and also putting in place the infrastructure for measuring pollutants of emerging concerns, since we see that that could be quite costly for cities. In Gothenburg, we've been measuring the air quality since the 1970s, and we can see that there's been a large improvement in the last 30 to 40 years, which is likely due to a combination of measures. 
Firstly, we have remedied some of our point sources of pollution in the city, and we've also redirected our heavy traffic to ring roads, so to allow for more efficient flow. During the 2000s, we can see that the decrease in air pollutants have been largely due to uh, reduced background emissions, because we also saw a population increase that counteracted the effects of technology improvement during this time. In Gothenburg, the main sources of pollution is from maritime and road transport, and road transport account for about one third of total emissions in Gothenburg, and it's also the dominant source of emissions at street level. This means that it has a considerable effect on human health. Now, as you saw from the beginning with Catherine's map of Europe, Sweden has quite good air quality, but still we see that 300 premature deaths are caused due to air pollution in Gothenburg, and around half of these are caused by background emissions. So, as you can imagine, for us it's very important to tackle road traffic to improve upon our air quality, which we do via a variety of measures in our Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan. For instance, we have an environmental zone type one, and we are looking to expand upon it to a zone type two and a zone type three, which essentially means we're moving up the Euro standards. Um, and we've taken the approach that we don't want to work with blocking, but rather focusing on innovation. So we have a zone called Gothenburg Green City Zone, which comprises three different geographical areas where we collaborate with businesses and academia for well, innovating, scaling up and testing new solutions for emission-free transport. And some of our current projects include wireless charging of taxis and electrified transport of goods. Um, yes, as I mentioned, we've also worked with redirecting uh, some of our heavy traffic to ring roads, but we're also looking into reallocating some of our roads to public transport lanes. We're electrifying our bus fleet, and we're also working a lot with cycling infrastructure and improving cycle lanes and cycle highways all over the city. Together with the congestion tax, we're hoping that this will mean that both citizens and visitors will opt for more sustainable means of transport when they come to Gothenburg. Uh, from a city planning perspective, Gothenburg is uh, growing quite rapidly and it's becoming denser, which on the one hand means that there is a reduced need for transport, but also means that if it's not managed properly, we could get more cars that, well, per capita, and also that there could be a decrease in ventilation, which means that the air pollution stays. So to tackle this, uh, we always consider access to public transport and the cycles cycle lanes when we plan new areas and we use the green space factor in our new developments. Um, we also use our digital twin, Virtual Gothenburg, to create uh, traffic scenarios and understand how our new developments can impact the city. And in Gothenburg, uh, innovation is seen as a key component of sustainable development, so we frequently take part in both national and EU innovation projects. And in this area, we have, for instance, explored the possibility of using sensors and the Internet of Things to complement uh, the environmental monitoring of air pollution. So we let our citizens build their own sensors and well to understand how the sensors themselves work and also understand how pollution works and one concrete example uh, result of this uh, example is that we're now publishing near real-time data for the air quality in Gothenburg and it's accessible to everyone via an open API and we're also hoping to build upon this project in a recently uh, well it was recently approved uh, a project via Horizon Europe and well, speaking of children, <laughs> we are also have another project that is ongoing where we're looking at the air quality outside of preschools. And here we're hoping to kind of combine solutions for tackling both noise and air pollution, primarily via green infrastructure, but also this <laughs> sounds interesting. So yeah. Um, so to finish off, uh, Gothenburg is one of the cities at the forefront of tackling air pollution. And we think that it's a good thing that well, science is kind of guiding the commission proposal. And we are curious to see uh, how the regional collaboration part is going to turn out. And we're also very careful in following the uh, potential for funding for monitoring uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lina, for also 
shedding more light on the local development, especially when it comes to Gothenburg, and uh, that indeed there are lots of initiatives happening and also innovative solutions. And it's interesting to listen and also make a parallel and see that there are interesting things happening, be it Spain or Sweden and France. There are. This is also another another note of optimism, and we can maybe that's good that we can also see how we can scale up these local solutions and regional notwithstanding of course as you mentioned that there are background emissions and there are some things that you can't do alone and that you also need support be it from the eu or also from other uh, actors and looking at the, the regional level how air pollution can be tackled but yeah that's great and we can we can then discuss uh, discuss further uh, on this um, uh, but yes so we heard from our panelists for today and of course we, we will continue the discussion but i would like to now uh, also give the floor to our uh, our respondents uh, for today before we give the floor to the audience uh, so we have first our first respondent is um, uh, Anne Stauffer a deputy director, uh, strategic lead, health and European and environment uh, alliance, HEAL. Uh, uh, and th thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, happy to hear any response, any reactions to what you heard from the panelists uh, today and also any additional reflection on how to improve the, air, uh, the, the quality of air in Europe. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, and thank you very much for providing me with the opportunity to respond uh, here the, to this afternoon. Um, as you said, I am from the uh, Health and Environment Alliance. We're an alliance of over 90 member organizations from the health community working for better health through healthy environment. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk about uh, represents uh, the, the views, the expertise of our members, but also uh, a larger health community. And actually, there are many, many, many health and medical organizations active now for clean air and closely watching, uh, you know, that this proposal, the, the proposal for the vision of the AQD uh, is as ambitious as possible. I wanted to make um, three remarks. Um, for the further uh, discussion. And the first one is around the urgency uh, to act to reduce the health burden. We've heard uh, a lot this afternoon already uh, about the importance of, of you know, um, air pollution, of tackling this issue, but I wanted to highlight that it's really, it's absolutely urgent and that we see a swift and a significant improvement in air quality as air quality or you know air pollution is a public health emergency and we're actually seeing a huge cost and a huge health burden that has accumulated over the years from uh, the impacts that we're seeing both in, when it comes to premature death but also when it comes to people having to live with disease uh, you know that that uh, is caused or is linked um, by air pollution those people with heart disease or people with asthma and this huge suffering uh, and in fact, uh, you know, many people now recognize this, including um, health insurers who actually see the huge costs that they're faced with uh, from air pollution and who are looking, you know, into measures and into, into um, ways um, to, pre to prevent this. So uh, we really think that policymakers absolutely, you know, need to recognize um, this urgency to act and act for prevention. I think the word prevention here is key. Uh, you know, every premature death, every asthma attack, every heart attack, every uh, workday lost that we see uh, from air pollution is actually an impact that is preventable with the right measures. So it's it's about, you know, how can we prevent these health impacts, not um, how can we best live with it, how can we best um, adapt this. It's really about prevention. And the second point I want to make is around uh, inequalities and vulnerability. We already heard from Catherine Gansleben uh, on the data, on the unfortunate differences we see uh, in the EU when it comes to the impacts, the health impacts from air pollution. Um, so I'll not go into details there, but I wanted to um, highlight again from the science, we also have this clear evidence on vulnerability and on inequalities. Uh, as we know, every one of us is under threat from air pollution, but some people or some groups in the population are more at risk than others. Uh, we heard about children before, so I'll not go into details there, but say there's a lot more evidence now on how children as health is harmed um, already before birth. And actually that can have consequences only much, you know, many, many decades later in their life. So again, this is about preventing these um, health impacts in the future, but it's also protecting um, the elderly. 
you know, in the past years with, with the pandemic, we've seen our policymakers taken significant steps, incredible steps, actually all of us to prevent, uh, you know, to protect our elderly, elderly um, population and those who are, who are at risk. Who were, who were then at risk um, from the from the coronavirus, um, and I I think now it's time when it comes to clean air, sorry, yeah, when it comes to clean air, with air pollution also being one of the top risk factors for chronic disease, to show the same level of commitment to protection, uh, you know, in 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 this revision, uh, and just on a side note, because we heard um, about. Uh, no, not a side note, but you know, we heard about positive trends and 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 um, encouraging news. I wanted to highlight that um, yes, you know, we have um, seen emissions going down. At the same time, the science has also evolved, and we have a lot more evidence. And actually, the latest science um, shows us how there uh, can be health harm and health impact already at very very low pollution levels, uh, and that there is. Uh, very likely no safe level of pollution, uh, which, you know, to me is the clear message that we actually need to significantly strengthen our efforts to uh, reduce air pollution and to improve um, air quality. So that's actually my third point. What needs to happen now? Um, you know, it's it's uh, good that uh, the Commission has published its proposal, um, because indeed, you know, for a long time, there was the need uh, to revise um, the, the EU clean air standards. But what needs to happen now is that we need to see a significant strengthening of the proposal. And we're looking to the member states and we're looking to the members of the European Parliament in doing so and actually including in this law and making this law, a, if you want a, a shining star, for health protection, for science-based um, air quality standards. Because what the Commission has put forward uh, is unfortunately not enough in terms of what's needed. It's based uh, on a too conservative impact assessment and consequently the level of ambition put forward is, is too low. Um, and so what does this mean in terms of uh, what needs, you know, what kind of improvements do we need to now need to see in the legislative process? Well, we do need uh, the full alignment of the EU's clean air standards with what the World Health Organization and what the latest science shows by 2030. This is currently not uh, proposed by the European Commission. The time frame there is 2050 which in view of the urgency and of the health burden that I was talking about earlier is clearly not um, adequate and not enough. And then we also need to see the right enabling framework in this, in this revised uh, directive. This means that only legally binding cl clean air standards will protect our health and especially the health of those most vulnerable we also have too many exemptions in this proposal when it comes to sticking to the clean air standards when it comes to the uh, you know that the, the delaying um you know they're they're really um they're really being binding when it comes to all the uh, conditions that can be put forward which again exempt uh, you know, from, from sticking um, climatic uh, conditions, weather conditions. Um, we also need to see um, improvements in, in really making sure that exceedances um, of air quality standards are kept as short as possible. Again, this is about our health and this is about what we need to best protect our health. Um, and we also need to see, um, you know, further improvements in the inform information requirements um, that are put uh, that are put forward. And I think this this very much, uh, you know, goes into details. I don't want to go there, but just to say that um, from a health perspective, there's definitely also there a need uh, for improvement. Um, yeah, for example, when it comes to when it comes to the alerts, or also when it comes to the air quality uh, indices giving health information. Uh, so to sum up and to end. Uh, you know, um, this uh, this uh, revised proposal or this, you know, what 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 would then ultimately be the outcome, uh, really needs to be the north star, uh, the guiding star, um, also for action in other areas. Um, we heard before that how it's all linked to, interlinked. Uh, it's indeed here um, the the case as well, uh, and uh, we we spoke about um, climate change action earlier and how Fit for 55 and other legislation will bring benefits. Well, it's also vice versa that you know we do need these stricter and these really health protective science based standards, also because they can uh, prompt and initiate um, and make sure.
sure actually we reach um, the EU's climate commitments and uh, progress on the necessary transformation um, that we need that we need to see. Uh, and so, yes, thank you very much for the opportunity and looking forward to the further exchange. Thank you so much. Uh, um... And for your reactions and also uh, stressing the importance, especially uh, on, on prevention and that uh, we need to think about that while also trying to find concrete solutions. We need to think about how to prevent uh, the air pollution from occurring and to think in the long term in that sense, how to how to again reach the quality of air that we really uh, want in eventually in line, of course, with uh, with the global standards set by the WHO. Thank you. And um, also our second uh, respondent for today, the uh, Margarita Toloto, uh, Senior Policy Officer for Air and Noise from the European Environmental Bureau. Uh, Margarita, thanks for joining us and also happy to hear your reactions to what we heard today and the reflections for the way forward. Yes. And share some views on the NGO position about the uh, recently published uh, proposal from the European Commission. Uh, I'm working for the European Environmental Bureau. It's a federation of environmental groups, uh, more or less 180 members uh, from 38 countries in Europe. We do work uh, together to find uh, a common agreement on how to move forward and try to push the debate at EU level, representing the also national interest and needs from our NGOs uh, members. So what I'm saying here is the uh, vision of uh, various and uh, different uh, ideas around uh, coming from around Europe. Uh, the proposal was indeed very much uh, awaited. We were expecting it uh, very much to be able to start working on this, and to be able to have finally an agreed revised legislation to be approved uh, in the first part of 2024. We do look uh, forward to this uh, really important level. Obviously, important actors in the debate are uh, member states, and when I say member states, I mean especially national governments. Uh, I must say, as by thing for improving air quality for its citizens, I think it's a very good example about how uh, money can be invested properly and how citizens can be part of the chain and not just be passive. And I would really like to see Gothenburg being promoting what they are doing to be able to uh, have cities following as well. Um, as I said, national governments have the greatest responsibility for what we'll be seeing uh, in the coming months, in the trilogues, and in the discussion between European Parliament and the Council. Uh, NGOs are obviously there to watch and to, to make sure that the right thing is said at the right moment, uh, hopefully to, to be able to see some uh, improvements in the especially looking at um, some specific elements uh, that are characterizing the enabling um, my colleague and I already the level of ambition uh, that the NGO indeed support, which is full alignment with WHO by 2030. But we also see the need for uh, making clear some requirements around the way in which you get there. Specifically thinking about the standard, we need to have uh, limit values have improved to be super effective to make sure that uh, competent authorities were um, kept accountable for the air quality and that citizens were also able to go to court and ask for this uh, action to be taken by um, the competent authorities. So limit values to play uh, a key role in the proposal and in the future, also beyond 2030. Then we see the importance of air quality plans to be um, not only um, there to remedy, but to prevent them. And this is the reason why we will be asking for the first air quality plans to be uh, agreed by 2025, sure that by 2030 we are in, on track with the WHO uh, standards uh, that we want to see here reflected in the proposal. I do appreciate the efforts made on uh, um, development, and I think there is a very important um, step forward made about uh, promote monitoring of ultrafine particle by carbon and. We do want to see stations for to make sure that the information is enough to establish a strong also uh, relative um, air quality standards for those pollutants as well. 
we have um, we do the efforts made on the access to justice penalties and compensation part of the proposal. This is a step forward, and uh, we look forward to a scenario where authorities can finally also be taken to court for not having respected the legislation because for uh, making sure that we do have uh, air quality corresponding to the legal requirements and they should be uh, taken to court. If they're not doing the job, they are supposed to. And those are just a few elements and I would be happy to go more into detail if there is any question further on. I would like just to spend a few words on parallel scenarios and parallel responsibilities. We are in a world where, I mean, the EU air quality legislation is made by different pillars. There is the AQD looking at standards. The IED, which is now revised, and then we have the national emissions at the overall total of national emissions and the reductions that have been um, defined for each member state. Um, national governments, again, the national pollution control program by the 1st of April 2023. And this is a call for also citizens to make sure that they see something happening on they ask why it's not yet ongoing because public consultation is mandatory for making sure that this program is reflecting also citizens' views. And then I want to flag the importance of making sure that agriculture and agriculture pollution is part of our debate regularly and constantly and even more. Uh, it's a too much disregarded source of pollution in the EU. We see the debate on the industrial emission directive being very sensitive um, for the agricultural part and the requirements for industrial uh, installation for um, Frank, how do we see for the, for the agricultural sector in Europe? And how do we make sure this is also delivering on the zero pollution ambition that we are all looking at at the moment? Uh, one just uh, my remind, uh, one last reminder for all of us to participate in the public consultation on the AAQD proposal. It will be open, if I'm not mistaken, until the 23rd of January. Uh, you can go to the website and comment on the proposal, uh, say your, your views and what you'd like to see changing in the debate. Thanks again for the invitation, and I'm looking at the exchange coming up. Thank you so much, Margarita, for, for your reactions and also for stressing the importance of mention. Also, uh, uh, importance of law enforcement actually so that we send the right uh, incentives and, uh, and then to clear clear message that air pollution is something to be addressed and shouldn't be actually tolerated uh, and, um, and that uh, indeed also more concrete suggestions when it comes to the ongoing uh, proposal on the air quality directive and hope it's something that can also be interesting for, uh, for Francois. Um, and also for the importance we talked about uh, transport, we talked about a number of uh, sources of emissions, but indeed agriculture being an important sector to always uh, to always bear in mind. So thank you, thank you for that. So uh, yes, we heard from our panelists, uh, we heard from our respondents. Uh, before, before I come back to the panel, uh, I would be happy to hear from our participants uh, if you have uh, any questions, uh, any comments. Uh, I see that um, I, I, I read that there are some questions already uh, from the um, uh, from our online participants. Uh, but of course, if you if I'm also looking at our in person uh, and I see a hand written. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, and I'll be happy to then give you the floor. So I, uh, the gentleman wanted to say something. At Tom Alim from Eurocities, so we are uh, a network of uh, more than 200 uh, European cities, so Gutenberg is one of our members. Uh, I just have a question to, well, all the panelists, maybe to Jérôme and Francois in priority, um, and also the, to, the, to the ladies online. Uh, what, how do you think uh, we could do more to improve um, the framework to help um, citizen science initiative actually in the field of air quality this is something that we see a lot um, uh, being developed in many of our mem uh, member cities uh, we feel this is a very interesting opportunity to well, to raise awareness uh, among citizens on the effect of air quality on the level of air quality uh, on the streets for instance um, but we were wondering internally at your cities so we think it's a good idea, but is it something that maybe the ambient air quality directive uh, could support? And do you feel that there is, um, well, that how, how what we could what could we do actually to to help uh, this this interesting 
um, developments to to be more spread uh, widespread in in Europe. So, is there something we could do, or so what's the, what should be the role of the EU framework? Uh, are there any questions from the audience in in the real world? While I'm skimming through the questions, and I will also direct them. So let's try to take a couple of them. Anis yeah. Volkman is Turquoise International. Uh, just a, a information question, really, to Francois Wackenhut. Could you give us a bit more information on the legislative timetable that, that you'll be looking at? Thanks. One more question, if there is one at this point. Uh, one, uh, if not now, then of course raise your hand whenever you think of a question or a comment you want to share with us. Uh, otherwise, uh, I can also come back to the panel. Yeah, maybe Francois, back to you on the question, I mean, on the concrete time timetable, and also on the question on how to involve uh, the cities and the citizen initiatives uh, in the ongoing process on the air quality. And uh, of course, uh, or, and also, uh, you, you happy to hear any other responses, reactions to other what panel panelists uh, have said thus far. Um, so the well, the second question on the legislative timetable. I understand you're referring to co-decision, the the timing of co-decision. Yeah. Um, well, the Commission's proposal to the Council and the Parliament on the 26th of October. Uh, we've had a first exchange views in the Council already under the uh, presidency. So that was a technical level. Um, work uh, in the ensuing presidency calendar. So Sweden first of course, uh, Spain afterwards. Um, in the European Parliament, um, the rapporteur is still to be designated, so there's no official confirmation of the name of the rapporteur yet. Um, however, the Parliament is already also active on the file. Um, shortly after the adoption of our proposal, Commissioner Sinkevicius was in the European Parliament presenting the zero pollution package, including the ambient air quality directives proposal um, and last week um, MEP Benova who's from uh, Slovakia and was from the SND party uh, organized uh, a very stimulating workshop uh, on uh, health and air quality and a number of uh, stakeholders here present were also involved in that discussion so um, that's what I can say about the um, state of discussions in the parliament and in the council when it comes to the overall timing constraints as you're coming slowly but slowly to the end of the mandate um, and so uh, and see in the first uh, semester of 2024 would be the last point by and the proposal would need to then be agreed by the co-legislator so Sorry, we've lost the sound. We can't hear anymore. It should be working. Okay. Yeah, uh, on the second question from uh, from Thomas, um, on citizen science, yes, citizen science has been very active in the field of uh, clean air. I mean, in Brussels, no, which uh, followed the company, had been um, active in, uh, in Antwerp, uh, Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, and so what I was going to say there is that these campaigns play a significant 
role when it comes to engagement of citizens. They are very much supported from our perspective because they help build ownership on the clean air file. They help sensitize citizens that are otherwise maybe not as versed in um, clean air. And clearly when it comes to schools, to hospitals, uh, they have played a role and we've seen that wherever they've been um, uh, developed, they've had an impact on the level of uh, understanding of the issue. So support for this, and we've actually also through through life, and Catherine probably would want to come in there because the agency is very much active in citizen science. Um, so uh, there's uh, probably a number of lessons that can be drawn also from the experiences that have been uh, developed so far. But I think the, the one element maybe of caution that I would mention is that these are fantastic tools for communications and for sensitization, but they're not substitutes to proper um, and uh, rigorous um, monitoring um, under the uh, framework that is foreseen under the directive. A monitoring station has a much heavier uh, cost, and that cost, of course, is also justified by the accuracy of the information that is provided. So as long as we see these tools as complementary tools, and they are essential complementary tools, as I said, so we're very positive about them, but we wouldn't be less positive if they would be presented as alternatives to monitoring and assessment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Joe, for the some technical difficulties uh, in communication, uh, but hopefully this will be uh, will resolve them. Um, and I see that uh, Catherine has her hand. Uh, uh, okay, great. I see yes. that uh, that Catherine has her hand risen. So happy to hear from you. Thank you. Yes, just very quickly on the citizen science, really to echo. Uh, what Francois said, um, you know, there's a lot of potential for these tools. Um, EEA produced a report called Assessing Air Quality Through to Citizen Science. I would put the link in the chat, but I don't think I can. I'm not sure if that works. Anyway, um, and we looked at both the types of sensors on the market, their strengths and weaknesses, and also some examples of campaigns that have been really successful. And I think at the local level, they can be really successful. I would echo what Francois said. I don't think those networks um, can replace the formal monitoring networks. Some of the sensors are really vulnerable to meteorological conditions, and there are some uncertainties about the readings. So I think it's more of a complementary tool, particularly in galvanizing public support. One area that I think would be super interesting would be looking at air quality around ports, because we have quite poor coverage of uh, monitoring stations close to ports. And we know that in some cities, emissions from shipping are really important in terms of contributing to poor air quality. And that would be super interesting to understand more about in the short term. Thanks. Thank you so much, Catherine, for, for your uh, also uh, response uh, on this. So, and um, I, I so I had a couple of questions. Uh, oh, oh. Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, oh, I, yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to comment also upon the citizen science uh, and where, like, what the EU could do. I think that one underutilized potential could be there was re, uh, the, earlier this year there was published a council recommendation for sustainable education, and I think that introducing citizen science tackling schools and including it into the education this way is an underutilized potential. Even though we were happy to see some of the like calls that were published in the recently released uh, Horizon Europe program that tackles citizen science and air pollution. See if it try works. Your, your... <laughs> <laughs> Seems to work. Is it? Do you listen to me? Yeah. Okay. Do you hear me? All right. Um, so to answer to your question, I think that first we have to better measure, and as we said before, uh, modeling, air quality station, micro sensors, and also the fields of the citizen are data interesting, important to be captured, and and uh, and restitute in a proper way, in a very simple way, in order for the citizen to better understand the phenomenon, because the phenomenon are quite complex. Um, that's the first point. The second one is having this data available and shared. You can let your citizen vote, because some actions are quite difficult to take. And so if you 
ask them to vote and to say, okay, do you want more metro? Do you want more car industry? Do you want no car industry? But that means that you will need to work on to find another way to, uh, you know, to move. Uh, then it could have an impact. And I have plenty of examples where, in fact, when you ask them to vote, they vote against, or sometimes even, I mean, you have surprising uh, decision or um, votes. So I think that for me, empower the citizen um, is very important. We talk about it with law, but we can also talk about uh, just, just, you know, some uh, citizen um, actions they can do on their own uh, in order to improve and find a way to improve. So sharing information, sharing decisions will be key for me in the in the new cities. Uh, I think Anne also uh, wanted to to. Thank you. Something. Indeed, I also wanted to come in on on the citizen science. Uh, as I mean, there there is an incredible amount of citizen science of air quality monitoring happening uh, across uh, the EU, also in Eastern Europe, where this is very much used by also grassroots initiative like the Polish uh, Smog Alert and others. And for me, this is also an expression uh, of the concern that, that people have, uh, you know, and they, they take to this um, also as a resort to see what is actually, you know, the, the level of pollution uh, in my area. And so for me, it's more than, than an awareness raising engagement. It also provides us with important data. Uh, for example, in Brussels, uh, you know, we had the Curieux in Air project, uh, you know, uh, 3000, uh, you know, people monitoring all across Brussels. And one of the important results from this monitoring was that it could clearly show that uh, air pollution is linked to, uh, you know, to social inequality, because, you know, in in some of the areas that were poorer in Brussels, where people didn't own a car, they were still exposed with higher air pollution. And that's important uh, data and evidence that I think needs to be used uh, much more and much better. So indeed, this is about um, complementary, you know, complementing that with, with the official monitoring. Uh, and there we would really hope, uh, you know, uh, for some more guidance uh, from the European Commission when it comes to harmonization, uh, especially um, also, uh, you know, uh, considering that when it comes to the official uh, monitoring stations, uh, some authorities have been very creative, uh, so to speak, uh, when it comes to the to the official monitoring. So I think there's definitely a, a gap uh, that needs to be covered in when it comes to really assessing the, the extent um, of, of pollution exposure. Thank you. Anne? Um, yes, please, if you're, yeah. to flag that uh, we do indeed think and agree on the fact that it's important that citizen science um, is there to raise awareness of the public. We also think that the burden shouldn't be put on the public to make sure that to make sure that the, the burden is not on citizens. So if there is the need for information to be gathered about a specific area, it means that if official monitoring is not providing it. And we, we think the first step should be taken in the official monitoring networks to be able to cover it properly. And also referring to uh, Catherine point on the OSPOS, uh, this is also the case for the official monitoring stations to be put in ports to make sure that we cover this area uh, in the way it should be covered on monitoring. Yes, thanks. Indeed, and the citizen initiatives and science should be in a way be complementary to the official monitoring equipment and efforts, and that one shouldn't necessarily substitute the other, but together they can have a good um, synergetic effect, so to speak. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for these reflections. And uh, yeah, so uh, I would like to actually come back to some of the questions we got from our virtual audience, and also some additional questions I will have my own uh, towards, uh, towards Francois. Uh, so, to start with uh, one general question, where maybe uh, when it comes to the uh, ambient air quality directive, could be maybe simple for people who are more, let's say, specialized in the topic, but also for everyone else to just understand. We talk a lot about that this proposal is now will imp should improve the the quality air quality standards, but then we also have the WHO guidelines where we can think about aligning with the guidelines more in the long run. But just can you just uh, maybe in, in, in a nutshell, what is actually, what is basically 
stopping us from already thinking about fully aligning with the WHO in a shorter term and with this proposal, like what are the key barriers? And then in a sense, we can think about solutions, policy solutions and so forth, are actually fully aligned. Maybe I should use a Yes. yes. Yep. In the microphone. Um, so thank you for this question. Um, well, we've conducted um, a very significant amount of underpinning work to arrive at uh, you know different levels of ambition that we've considered and the one that we've proposed in what has eventually been adopted by the Commission, and that is based on the better regulation framework of the Commission that looks not just at the health dimension, which of course we duly looked at based on the WHO recommendations in the first place but also looking at the socioeconomic uh, dimension um, and technical feasibility. And um, when um, we have conducted all this work, it is very clear that uh, if we look at a time frame that is 2030, which is the one for which we've established intermediate targets that are not fully aligned with the WHO, but are considerably more ambitious than what we uh, had on the table now, I'll just give an example with uh, PM 2.5, which is the, the pollutant that we refer to uh, most commonly as the one that has most uh, harmful impacts on health. Um, you know, we're looking at a jump from 25 micrograms per cubic meter to 10, and the WHO is uh, suggesting um, that we go to five. So we're in a situation where there is a jump that is very significant, and that jump is completely underpinned solidly by the analysis that uh, guides our work. As you may be aware, the WHO does not look at anything else than health because its mandate is health. Um, but there is no consideration, and the WHO themselves say it in the guidelines, about um, the uh, socioeconomic um, feasibility uh, and um, factors that need to be taken into account. And the WHO does, to that purpose, provide a number of interim targets in order to guide the efforts of the various uh, uh, governments that do want to look at uh, an increased level of ambition. And what we have chosen to do goes into the uh, high ambition end of the interim targets as proposed by the WHO, and that is 2030. And when I hear, you know, we should have gone uh, for more ambition, well, in an ideal world, we should have gone for more ambition, but in, in a real world, we're also not speculating about changes that may or may not happen in a very short term. And some of our uh, discussions which have been very open over the two years uh, that preceded the uh, tabling of the proposal have uh, amply sort of dwelled on those dimensions. And for instance, because I think that it's worth um, mentioning concretely what we're talking about here, we've been um, uh, discussing with a number of, uh, of stakeholders about you know whether our impact assessment should have been more encompassing in the types of radical changes that should be considered. I'll give you an illustration of this dietary changes. Um, you know, we have not been disruptive in anticipating that in five years' time, everybody will be flexitarian. You may criticize us for this, and it's legitimate, but we don't believe that speculating about where we may be in five years' time mm -hmm. on uh, dietary changes is something that should guide policymaking. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to um, uh, the overall sort of technical technological jumps that may be possible. We also chose to, you know, look at something that reflects the overall frame as we can anticipate based on the technologies that are on the table now and that are encompassed in what Fit for 55 proposes. And I would like to maybe close with this: our uh, baseline is also already an extremely ambitious one because our baseline builds on the full implementation of Fit for 55 and the full implementation of all relevant source legislation proposals that relate to clean air. And as proposed by the Commission, now some of you are also following actively some of the discussions in Council and in Parliament on some of those other proposals. In some cases, it is so. There is alignment there in terms of the level of ambition with what the Commission has proposed. In some other instances, if I uh, think of uh, yeah, some of the discussions that are ongoing, I don't always see the same level of ambition as the Commission has proposed. So I think that we've been balanced um, in precisely going for you know a, a scenario that is credible, robust, because it is essential that we be extremely solid about what we're talking about, about what we can achieve by 2030, rather than what we would wish to uh, achieve. And 
Along the way, and that's the luxury of uh, what we've got on the table, which I think is going to go a long way in satisfying the various interests, uh, including those that claim we should be more ambition, because we would want more ambition to, of course, be considered as early as possible. For that, we will have the 2028 review that will precisely look at um, societal evolution, so that could cover dietary changes, that will look at technological uh, evolutions, and of course, the evolution of the scientific uh, advice and evidence that we'll have on the table by then, which may be even um, uh, stringent, uh, even more stringent than what is available now. So in a nutshell, I think that what we've got on the table is going to be uh, rock solid, and that's why we went for it. But we are certainly committed to going beyond mm -hmm. on the basis that we can solidly underpin, and in any case, by 2050, but I hear that for some, this is seen as too late. So that's why we have the review mechanisms. But by 2050, we have the zero pollution objective that is also in the directive. Thank you for, for this clarification. And one way or another, you're also keeping in mind also this uh, 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 additional uh, guidelines provided by the WHO. But indeed, uh, thanks for clarifying on the approach. Uh, there was a question uh, from an anonymous uh, on the... <laughs> on some specific rules or if there are on, um, when it comes to air quality uh, from polluted in forest, forested areas, but also burning wood in stoves by households. Because industrial emission. So maybe we can also frame it as an indoor air quality uh, standards versus external air quality and pollution, especially from industrial sources. Uh, is there something you can say more about these uh, uh, relevant rules or potential rules when it comes to indoor air quality versus the ones that are actually govern more like the yeah the external air quality and uh, mainly caused by a transport industry and so forth? Yeah, I mean, if if the question is, do we cover indoor air pollution through this proposal? The answer is no, because it's about ambient air quality. Mm -hmm. Um, if the second question is, do we care about indoor air pollution? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And um, when it comes to indoor air pollution, there are, um, well, uh, references in the Zero Pollution Action Plan that the Commission adopted in, um, in May 2021. And in the context of the implementation of the Zero Pollution Action Plan, clearly the question of uh, indoor air pollution and what further action is to be considered there is certainly on the table. And it touches on a number of uh, relevant policy areas. And certainly one of those areas is, uh, um, well, what people burn at home that may not just have an impact on ambient air quality, but also on the indoor air they breathe. Um, and um, on, on that, uh, there is work that is ongoing. There's been a lot of work in DG research um, uh, that has gone into indoor air pollution as well. And uh, we work closely with the relevant services of the commission to look at the overall frame. But as you know, there is no legislative framework that is um, dedicated to indoor air pollution as things stand at EU level. Um, but there is a, a lot in terms of even construction materials. And, you know, there are many aspects of our work that look at indoor air um, quality as well. And, uh, uh, you know, to make a link directly to uh, the heating systems that you referred to, um, we have also a renovation wave at EU level. We have uh, a lot that is uh, ongoing when it comes to energy efficiency, insulation of buildings, and all of that is also at the core of addressing indoor pollution. So not yet directly mm -hmm. as perhaps the request would uh, want to go to, but certainly uh, through many aspects that have a direct bearing on the uh, level of indoor air pollution there is. Mm -hmm. Much. Uh, Catherine, I see you raised your hand, so happy to hear from you. Thanks very much. Yes, just to compliment Francois on indoor air, um, because I think another relevant policy framework is the chemicals legislation. Some of the issues with indoor air are um, chemicals that are released from products and building materials like flame retardants, phthalates, that are not just in the air, but also collect in dust. 
um, where children crawl around on the floor. And it is tricky, right? Because um, there is no monitoring framework. It's inside people's houses. So it's outside the public sphere and into the private sphere. There has been research monitoring air quality in schools. There was a project called Symphony, which was quite interesting and really had some quite um, serious implications in terms of air quality in schools linked to emissions of chemicals. So I would say the chemical strategy for sustainability, which is a fantastically aggressive um, strategy that we now need to see implemented and also opportunities to control chemicals under reach um, can significantly contribute to better quality air indoors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for this additional uh, reflections. And uh, then going back to some of the written questions we received, um, uh, Lina, maybe you would be uh, best position to answer or uh, 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 answer what some of these. So it's from uh, Thomas, uh, it's for Thomas uh, Kerting. Uh, basically, he asks, uh, tackling air pollution is often a combination of clean air expertise and solutions to be deployed locally. Do territories, let's say regions, municipalities, have access to tanks of solutions, maybe um, knowledge or know-how? Uh, is there an economic development plan alongside with the revision of the directive? Does a clean air economy strategy exist? I'm asking this uh, you. Uh, I'm asking this because uh, I'm wondering when you when you mention some of the solutions and local policies. Uh, indeed, do you always have access to the know-how and to the expertise you need? How do you acquire it? And also, how do these let's say uh, uh, um, air air quality plans relate to other uh, policies and for social economic development within Gothenburg, but also uh, when we look at the county level, the regional uh, level, is there something interesting that could also we could share that could be maybe scaled up or be interesting for our uh, speakers or participants in this regard? <clears throat> so there are a few things. <laughs> So first, we have uh, a regional collaboration with the neighboring municipalities for tackling certain air pollutants. So it's uh, for nitrogen dioxide, and we are have it tackled with an action program. And we also, for we collaborate with the monitoring stations with these municipalities, also for our mobile stations that we use for moving around when there are developments in our municipalities. At the moment, we used it to replace uh, a permanent station, for example, that was, um, we had to block a road for a development we were doing so that we moved one of these regional collaboration ones to replace it. Um, we also collaborate a lot with industry and academia because we don't always have the answers. So we have, as I mentioned, this green, uh, Gothenburg Green City Zone, where we come together with lots of different stakeholders along the well transport value chain, essentially, and we test <laughs> and see if it works and then we scale it up. Um, so, yeah, and what else was it he wanted to know? <laughs> well, it was more about how to link these different pla uh, plans, action plans, strategies, for yes. example, on pollution, air quality, with, uh, with, with maybe other strategies on economic development, mm -hmm. social development. How can these be somehow integrated so that they feed into one uh, to each other? In Gothenburg, we've also in, uh, included these into our municipal master plans, which is like the overarching document deciding everything that we do apart from the budget. And so like because of that, we have also collaboration structures between the different departments to like establish these, well, the synergies between the action plans essentially. But we think this could also be improved. Um, as I mentioned, we have, well, air quality plan but we also have the sustainable urban mobility plan we have a plan for tackling noise pollution and these are all well different departments to some degree working but we're trying to bring them together and here i think also it's like the new kind of uh, way of working toward mission-based rather than project-based could also help us in innovating our governance structure and like, furthering this work Thanks. Uh, thanks. And sure, exactly. You were the, you were the next. Uh, okay, Mr. but, Trump, if I, but if I just uh, you can first respond. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, um, it's also sometimes interesting to use modeling 3D impact in order to anticipate the problem. I would take one example in Paris. In fact, um, they start to build the big buildings, uh, and in fact, they they realize after during the permitting period that they, it will create more pollution because you will concentrate the air 
and so you you will you, you will limit the flow, airflow, and so you will create uh, let's say a dark point, okay, a high polluted point. And in fact, the project was abandoned after years and years of study and so on. And in fact, now there is a new regulation, a new yeah recommend. It's more than a recommendation; it's, it's by law that you need to have a 3D assessment impact assessment before launching uh, your project. And so, in fact, you win time uh, using these new tools. So, as we said before, five, ten years ago, you do you, you could not do that because the tools did not exist. Or, but now it exists, and um, and so you could anticipate and limit the time before and, and the decision time and also to demonstrate that the, the decision you take is also sustained by facts. And to also build on that, uh, uh, when it comes to the solutions you shared, uh, Jerome, previously, they, one way or another, to my understanding, also involve collaboration with the authorities, the local authorities, regional authorities, and I'm interested to know more about any, say, lessons learned, you know, what are, what is actually, what are the enabling factors when it comes to collaboration with the policy authorities? Also, what are the potential barriers uh, that can affect, you know, the, the scaling of the deployment or certain solutions uh, to improve monitoring, to improve air quality, to use new innovative solutions? Uh, and also uh, any, let's say, uh, suggestions, recommendations on this, the policy uh, 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 intervention that can help also your uh, in your work from the EU level, the national level, the investments that are needed, uh, potential public-private par partnerships uh, that can be further developed. I mean, arguably, one could say that uh, 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 if there is a will, there is a way. But if there is something more, you can share any insights that could be interesting because that is uh, important, I would say, point to, to scale up all these solutions that we already have or that could be further developed. Yeah. Sure. Thank you for the question. Yeah. And in fact, so we realized that, so we start to implement solution in cities like five, five years ago. And when we start to discuss with mayors, some of them didn't want to disclose that in their city, the, the, the air quality was not good. The, the problem they are facing today is that in fact, citizens um, find the information by themselves. Uh, they buy some sensors and so on. And, and so today we have a new wave coming of politicians that they want to act because they know that if they don't do that, if they don't do that now, it will be a problem in two, three, five years. Um, so I think that things are changing in this way. And coming back to my first point, so uh, said earlier, empower, um, by empower, empowering citizens, we will also speed up the scale up. That's the first thing. The second is the return on investment. Uh, I think it's Francois that said, stated that before. Uh, it's investing one euro today uh, will bring you, seven, I think it was six, seven times, seven times, seven times your, 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 your investment. So in, at least, okay, the US EPA evaluated to one for 30, something like this 20 years ago. So I think that, yes, it's worth to invest in this and we need to invest more. Today, if there is one, I mean, one of the, the barriers to scale up is the investment. But if then we, and I think that it's, perhaps it's Anne mentioning the, the health insurance. In fact, if uh, the health insurance starts also to invest or um, uh, let's say encourage the investment because they know that it will have an impact for them and so for the society, then of course it will speed up the scale up. So I think that financing is important and then measuring the social impact too, because we saw that there is some inequality. And, and in fact, the COVID situation also, the COVID crisis shows that people that were living in a polluted area were more exposed to the, to the, to the COVID or let's say some virus um, and the body was not, the defense of the body was not as strong as some people living elsewhere in, in, a, in a place where the Air, air pollution is lower or air quality is better. So I think that it's also important to measure the social impact and the equality it could bring by investing in the right place, um, the right amount of money. 
thank you for for these reflections and it's interesting dynamics between in a way uh, local authorities and decision making this is empowered by citizens but also if you you can empower citizens themselves with these solutions so there could be an interesting positive feedback between between the two and indeed that is important to depict that this is not necessarily public spending as such is also invest investments because of the return uh, rates and um, yeah the whole question on insurance is very interesting also as as, as as elaborated by Anne and it brings us to another topic of sustainable finance agenda in the upcoming taxonomy but I don't, unfortunately I'm not sure we have time to cap capture that in 10 minutes but it's just good to be mindful also this initiative is everything is connected in that yes. sense because it can affect the way how our private uh, investments are directed and channel channelized uh, towards let's say more uh, say towards the green uh, investments so that is indeed a interesting also something to keep in mind uh, I'm just checking if there are any final comments or questions from the participants uh, in the real world yes please uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, discussion um, I have more maybe a question for Francois uh, for the future thinking, because um, today we have uh, been talking about solutions, your proposal, um, great, great things happening. So that makes us happy. But uh, we have nothing, nothing has been said about the energy crisis that is going on now. And of course, we know everybody's looking at renewables and um, innovation there because we are not there yet. Um, how will that impact and of course we have only 10 minutes left it's just to raise a reflection and to think about and maybe to come back to it later um how will that impact this proposal do you think because there is now the consultation period but also looking further to the next leg legislative um period as of 2024 um we have had the green deal which was great during this legislation Words, what is that going? We have heard already in some roundtables here in Brussels talking about the European Energy Union and how do we then see the sustainability build into that, etc. So, of course, looking forward, there is a lot happening and that we don't have, have time to discuss now, but is that on the mind? Or do you see that? Long question with a long answer, maybe, but what are the first thoughts about that? <laughs> Try to address it as much as we can <laughs> with the time frame. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No, this is this is a very uh, interesting question and a very complex question at the same time because there are many parameters that uh, we cannot really anticipate at this point about how the current situation will impact on the future political agenda because uh, that will also depend on the sort of political dynamics that will emerge. Um, in 2024. But what I can say now about the way the Commission is looking at the energy crisis is that, you know, we need to, to act on two priorities concomitantly. There is a need to respond to the energy crisis that many of our fellow citizens feel and feel very, very um, strongly. And uh, to not be able to heat your house in wintertime is, I think, as much as in equality priority as uh, the right to clean air. And uh, the second part to this is that these things are not antagonistic um, in the sense that the energy crisis has certainly from the Commission's perspective been used also as a formidable way of demonstrating how right it is to accelerate the transition to cleaner energy, to um, energy efficiency, to better installation of buildings, uh, to reduce dependencies at all level and uh, at all levels, and not just for independencies, but also for independencies, obviously, but also our dependency on energy sources, which are problems in terms of the transition um, that we all want to achieve. Um, it's inevitable as we see it that there are some short term tensions, as we do also hear more from some member states than before that uh, because of the energy crisis, they cannot uh, prioritize uh, you know, uh, all aspects of the Green Deal's transition and not even specifically focusing on clean air here. Our response to this is that 
clean air when it comes to the file that I follow most closely is actually one of the conditions for them to succeed also on the energy front. Because, you know, the less energy we use, the better we are in terms of dependencies and the better we are also in terms of air pollution, certainly when it comes to PM emissions. So I, I think that we need to construe an argument that also demonstrates that the facts are with us, and they are. Um, so in that sense, you know, there's a the saying that usually goes, never waste a crisis. I, I think the commission is working not to waste this crisis in terms of what it represents as a means to really continue to deliver on the Green Deal's agenda. And the last part to your question was, you know, what happens in the medium term? I think what protects us from any attempts externally to diminish the importance of the transition is the fact that many of the targets that we have, and not just on clean air, but I mean, if we look at these, it's 2030 now and 2050. If we look at the NEC, we also have a 2020-2030 framework, uh, the next, sorry, the, the National Emission Reduction Commitments Directive. But if we look at climate, we also have commitments that are very much going into the climate neutrality objective. So I personally believe that this is a personal view, because this is a bit speculative uh, thinking uh, that we're having here, that it would be very difficult to move away, to deviate from the agenda, because the agenda has been set. And if you look at the overall Fit for 55 as well, it's been set to shape policies for a long time ahead of us, you know, take uh, CO2 and cars, 2035, the uh, full electrification transition. I don't think that it would be easy to deviate from all these commitments um, so easily, which doesn't mean that one does not need to be vigilant about temptations, as we've always seen, by the way, whatever the policy cycle, you know, uh, I think many of us have gone through different policy cycles and you always see that there's an attempt to derail an agenda based on, you know, food security, based on uh, whatnot. So I think that vigilance is of the essence, but having strong targets and having a strongly underpinned set of policies where, you know, the economics are clearly demonstrated, where the facts are with us, will help us to resist and prevail. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for the question and also for your response, because that was exactly the, the, the final question I have, I wanted to ask, which is on the energy. No, it's perfect. It is perfect to hear from you and uh, to, to reflect upon it uh, further, which is, of course, on the impacts of the energy crisis when it comes to the uh, clean air uh, agenda. And thanks so much for, for, for sharing some of your uh, views uh, on this topic. And uh, um, that's something that I actually also wanted to uh, ask uh, Catherine, if you have any also uh, 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 um, uh, thoughts on this, uh, how, how does the current energy crisis uh, impact uh, uh, the air quality in Europe? Because we know that at least in the short run, some impacts are to be expected because we are, we are Fact is that we are burning more coal than we did before because of the energy uh, shortages, but and of course, the, arguably this will not be the shouldn't be the case later on. But still, from your perspective, when you look at how, how the EEA has been looking at this case since the the start of the of the Russian invasion and uh, the energy crisis, how do you see uh, how do you see this uh, interlinkage between the crisis and the air quality or pollution? Thanks. Um, well, I think Francois gave a very eloquent response from the political perspective. Um, I did touch on this in my presentation, making the link to energy poverty. And I think what we what we'll expect to see this Christmas is an increase in levels of PM 2.5, uh, particularly in the poorer regions of um, Eastern Europe, where there's a higher dependency on coal. I mean, we see some countries have um, allowed the use of the most polluting coal in um, heating, domestic heating, which is a really retrograde step. Of course, we understand the rationale behind it, but we really do need to stay on track and cut our dependency on fossil, fossil fuels, as Francois said. Um, at EEA, we receive what we call up-to-date data, which is hourly data on air pollution, and that's available 
um, on our website and also summarized in our European Air Quality Index for people to see. I think once we have the full set of data for this winter, then we'll be able to do an analysis and look and see whether we see a change between um, data for 2020, 2021 and 2022. And that will allow us to do an actual assessment of any change in air quality on the basis of monitoring data. Thanks. Thank you so much for your additional reflections on this. Uh, so we have, uh, Less than two minutes left. I think uh, opening any additional discussion, unless there are any final burning comments or actions from any of the speakers on any of the matters we discussed today, which there is from Anne, uh, then we can hear from you. <laughs> And then I will need to wrap up slowly, but yeah. Sure, uh, just briefly on, on, on the current situation. I think what's important is to uh, not blame people um, for that they take every means, uh, you know, to heat their homes and keep warm. Warm when this is, you know, this is uh, beyond their choice. This is actually a, a situation of failed uh, policies, uh, you know, and a history of failed policies um, that we're currently seeing. And, and Heel and others are, you know, uh, closely watching and advocating to prevent uh, false solutions and to prevent that many of these um, temporary measures that are now put in place uh, actually don't lead us to to continued lock-in um, of pollution, you know, be it for uh, fossil gas infrastructure, but be it also when it comes to promoting and subsidizing wood burning uh, as a climate-friendly alternative, when we already see that we have many, many problems from wood burning um, because of the air pollution wood burning, and we do need to urgently uh, act on that. And, you know, when it comes to this, the current situation for me and for the health groups, this is actually the, the prompt uh, to step up and uh, actually an argument to say, well, this is why we need to have these stricter clean air standards, you know, to, to lead us really into, uh, you know, into this transformation and to lead us to healthy energy and healthy mobility and all these other things. So it's, it is very much, uh, you know, talking about what is actually needed to better protect our health and not so much about a balanced perspective or a realistic one. It's really what do we need to finally, swiftly and, you know, medium term get to better health protection and, and, and you know, and alleviate that immense suffering uh, that we're that we're seeing currently from from a poor air quality across Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, and yeah, it's a good uh, way also to, to wrap it up that we need to be uh, ambitious and to be uh, purpose driven that we as we discussed today, we talk about the air, uh, air pollution, which is damaging our health and our economy. And that in a way, and as also mentioned uh, uh, um, by, by Francois, for example, that these are the investments. So it's not necessarily as a trade being a trade off, but actually as something where it's benefit all of the other aspects of our lives, economy and society, and that we need to try to find a, a ambitious and realistic way that we that we actually end up with uh, breathing the cleaner air than we currently have. Uh, so uh, indeed, I think this is we managed to tackle a number of uh, topics today when it comes to this uh, uh, to, the, to, to, to air quality and air pollution as much as we could in in, in two hours. And of course, more we can always uh, uh, dive more deeply into this discussion. And indeed, the EPC will be running a project on air quality and air pollution uh, in the uh, basically starting from more or less now, until uh, uh, the mid uh, next uh, uh, year. So we'll be happy to keep in touch with you and everybody interested in this topic further to involve you in the discussions that will be held uh, uh, later on uh, as part of this uh, project. But yeah, for now, uh, thank you so much for all your involvement to uh, speakers and respondents for a very interesting and useful uh, uh, reflections and for uh, uh, to also to our participants for your attendance and very active uh, involvement. And of course, looking forward to having you at our future uh, discussions. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye.